Hey, if you've got your Bibles this morning, I'd love you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 15. And we are closing out uh, this week, this Sunday, we're closing out our series, which we began called Influences. And uh, we, we've, we've been talking this month really about how you and I are called to be salt and we are called to be light in our world. We're called to be influences uh, for Christ wherever we are. And uh, we're going to read a story, a very well-known story from the book of Luke chapter 15 that Jesus spoke about. And it says this in Luke chapter 15 and verse 1. It says, Many dishonest tax collectors and other notorious sinners often gathered around to listen as Jesus taught the people. This raised concerns among the Jewish religious leaders and experts of the law. Indignant. They grumbled and complained, saying, look at how this man associates with all these notorious sinners and welcomes them all to come to him. In response, Jesus told him a story. He said, there was once a shepherd with 100 lambs, but one of his lambs wandered away and got lost. So the shepherd left the 99 lambs out in the open field and searched in the wilderness for that one lost lamb. I love this. He didn't stop until he finally found it. With exuberant joy, he raised up that lamb, placed it on his shoulders, and he carried it back with cheerful delight. Returning home, he called all of his friends, his families, his neighbours together and said, let's have a party. Anyone want to have a party here this morning? He says, come and celebrate with me the return of my lost lamb. It wandered away, but I found it, and then I brought it home. Jesus continued in the same way, there will be a glorious celebration in heaven. How good is that? over the rescue of one lost sinner who repents. I love how Jesus says they come back home. They return to the fold, more so than for all the righteous people who never strayed away. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. I pray that you would open our eyes to see you. I pray that you would open our ears to hear you. Lord God, this morning, I pray, God, in this place this morning, God, that as your word is open, God, that it would speak life and blessing and direction to every one of us here this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that no matter what's happened in the past, that truly the best is always yet to come with you. And we pray your blessing over every person, over our church and over our city in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Amen. I wanna speak to you on the topic this morning, lost and found, lost and found. I have a theory that uh, if we were to survey this room there's some people here this morning and you are, you are very good at finding things. Uh, I would also say that if we did a survey of this room, there'd also be some people here this morning and you're very good at losing things. I think you fit into either one of those two categories. You're either very good at finding things or you're very good at losing things. I'd like to stand in the gap for those who have a gift for losing things this morning. I'd like to actually identify that it's a gift, people. <laughs> It's an unrecognised gift, it's an uncelebrated gift, but it is a gift, truly. I believe it's an unrecognised gift that you have for losing stuff. I just want to say right now, I I join the the, the clan of people here this morning that actually identifies with having that gift of losing things. In fact, my gift is actually at a high level, people. I have a gift for losing very expensive things. Anyone else join me in that gift? I, I have a gift for losing very expensive things. I have a gift for losing expensive Christmas gifts. I have, a, I have a, a gift for losing expensive uh, birthday presents that are given to me. I, I, I have a gift. I, I can even lose children at a moment's notice. It's just a gift wherever we go. Just things of value, I, I tend to lose them pretty quickly. Uh, and so I've become, I've become recognized that I'm, I'm seriously good at this. Uh, and so uh, there's actually, if you were to look at my phone and just check the Bluetooth settings, and you'd see what's hooked up to my phone, you'd probably notice that where it says AirPods, it actually says Andrew's AirPods 6. (laughs) There's a reason that it says Andrew's AirPods 6 and not Andrew's AirPods 1s because my AirPods uh, seem to get lost a little bit here and there. And uh, so I want to tell you about the last judgment on the front row and the second row. It was like six, six, I know, it's true. Uh, I have, I've had a few incarnations of AirPods. I've probably had most of the versions of them along the way. And uh, so the last time I happened to misplace uh, my AirPods was earlier on this year. And so I recognised there was a moment where I'd lost my AirPods. And so uh, I was like to myself, okay, I need to find them. I've, just, I've put them somewhere, left them somewhere. I'm going to find them. So I was determined. 
I'm going to find his AirPods. But I also did not want to let the rest of my family know that I'd lost my AirPods at the same time. So it was, it was, it was a search mission solo mode. So for 48 hours, I mean, I'm determined to find these AirPods. I'm, I'm, I'm consulting my calendar. I'm retracing my steps. I'm looking at all the places my AirPods possibly were in that time. And I'm searching and I'm seeking and I'm, I'm, I'm calling places and, and, and nothing is turning up. Nothing's turning up. And after 48 hours, I'm like, gosh, where are these AirPods? Anyway, I came home and then uh, as I came through the door, uh, Wendy, uh, my, my beautiful wife, was there and said, oh, Andrew, um, have you lost your AirPods? I was like, how? I was thinking to myself, how does she know? Then I remembered she's a wife. Of course she knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I said, yeah, I have lost my AirPods. And then uh, she said, um, oh, well, uh, good news is uh, uh, we found them. I said, great. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And uh, so then she proceeded to show me the AirPods. And uh, she said to me, look, we found them on the driveway. So when she showed me the AirPods, they didn't look like the AirPods I'd lost <laughs> two days earlier. They, uh, they actually uh, were a slightly more compact uh, version. And this, I did not have this for the last service. My son, who's on the screens this morning, had this photo on his phone and he put it up there. Uh, and so there's the evidence. And so we redubbed those, not AirPods anymore, we redubbed them Dad's Flat Pods. And uh, they hung up as a little memorial above our fridge for several months. And, uh, and there they were. And so, uh, so we ended up getting a replacement uh, set of AirPods. But you know, the good news is, people, it's now six months and counting and I've had those AirPods and nothing's been lost. I know, I know. It's a record. It's a record. It's amazing. But I was thinking about that. I was thinking that actually, you know, for the two days, uh, for two days, for 48 hours, I was obsessed with finding my AirPods. Like, I was, it was, it was a rescue mission. It was a search mission. I was determined to do everything within my power to find my AirPods. And, and here's the thing. The reason that I was so intent on trying to find my AirPods was because of their value. The reason I was, I was so intent on, on, on trying to locate it, trying to find them and, and, and bring them back was because they had value to me. Like if, if I had recognised in a moment that I'd lost a, like a black pen, I'm not going to search too hard. I'm just, I'm just going to, I'll, I'll replace that. But the reason that I was wanting to search that hard was because of the value. And listen, when you lose something of value, when you lose something that's precious to you, when you lose something that has worth to you, you will search high and low until you find it. Because here's the thing, the value of what is lost determines the passion of your rescue mission. The value of what's been lost to you determines both the passion and the desire with which you will search for what has been lost. In other words, your heart and attitude is, is that I will do whatever it takes to find what I've lost. Jesus in Luke 15 tells us a story because the story is a window to show us his heart. He, he tells us a story because in the story, we can see God's heart for what he's lost. He says there was once a shepherd that had 100 lambs, but one of those lambs that was precious to him, that was valuable to him, that, that was of immeasurable value to him, wandered away and was lost to him. So the shepherd, Jesus, leaves the 99 that had been found out in the open field and he begins a search in the wilderness. The picture of the wilderness is he's, he's climbing mountains, he's going through valleys, he's crossing rivers, he's searching high, he's searching low for one lost lamb. And I love how it says that he didn't stop or he wouldn't stop until he found the one that was lost. You see, Luke 15 tells us something I believe that is so significant when it comes to knowing who God is. Luke 15 is a story that Jesus told us so that we would know that our God is relentless in his pursuit of every single person. 
that, that actually Jesus told Luke 15 so that we would know that, that our God is a seeker. And our God actually knows when even one is missing. In fact, the, the scripture here is really saying that, you know what, God's heart actually aches. God's heart is moved when even one person is lost to him. You know, God never says, you know, as he's, as he's looking after the hundred in this context, never says, well, well, you know, near enough is good enough. 99 out of 100 is not bad. I can settle with that. No, no, the, no, the, the Bible here says that, no, no, God actually leaves the 99 to begin this pursuit. He begins this relentless pursuit to continue to seek after, to continue to, to chase after, to continue to pursue with his love that one that is lost to him. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, the Lord is not willing. You know, there's things that the Lord's not willing to happen. He said, this is not my will, that any should perish. You know what, what's that scripture saying? It's saying God's not willing that anyone would leave this earth without having discovered his love. And his salvation in their life. He said, God's not willing that any should perish, any should be lost to him. But what's God willing? That everyone, all should come to repentance. You know, God is not willing that any person would perish. God, God's heart is for the one who's away from him. And God is very clear. He says, I, my plan, my purpose is that every single person would come to repentance. In other words, that they would have a change of direction, a change of mind, a change of heart, to find Him. You know, why is that? Because God is a seeker. God is a seeker at heart. You know, God is seeking you to have a relationship with you. God is seeking you because He wants to heal you. God is seeking you because He wants to bring you into freedom, freedom from the past, freedom from fear, freedom from things that, that would bring you into bondage in your life. God is seeking you so that he can have a relationship with you. And church, I want to tell you, this story in Luke chapter 15 that Jesus shared, it is the gospel in seven verses. It is the gospel in seven verses. This is the good news, people. The whole reason that our church exists is that everyone would know this message, that there is a God who loves them and that there is a God who is seeking them. And here's the thing about God seeking. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter the reason that, that we have become maybe distant or disconnected from God. It doesn't matter because God says, I'm seeking you because I want to bring you into relationship with me. Do you know, we see this not just in the story that Jesus told and in the way in which Jesus lived. We actually see it right back in the book of Genesis. Right at the very beginning, we see it. The Bible says that Adam and Eve were created. They had relationship with God. They had fellowship with God. That's the way you and I were designed to live. But it says that Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God. It says at the very moment that Adam and Eve sinned, what happened is two things began, or they began to experience two things in their life they'd never experienced before. Shame and fear. Shame and fear. For the first time in the, in the history of their existence, the first time in the history of humanity, these two things called shame and fear entered the equation. They felt shame for what they had done and they, they were fearing what God's response would be. The end result was that Adam and Eve began to separate themselves from God. It said they actually began to hide themselves away from God. They, they, they literally began to make camo gear for themselves and say, Let, let's hide over here away from God because fear and shame caused them to separate. And that's actually the greatest consequence that we experience of sin is that actually sin separates us from God. Sin begins to disconnect us from God. But I love the response in Scripture. The very moment that Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible shows us that God actually literally feels the tear of that separation and He immediately began, began seeking them. He began calling out, Adam, Eve, where are you? Where are you hiding? And it's God that begins the, first, the very first ever search and rescue mission, and that's to find Adam and Eve and begin what is the process of restoring them back into relationship with Him. Why would God do that? Because God is a seeker. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said the same words. He said, For the Son of Man, referring to Himself, has come to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus saying, You want to know my purpose? You want to know what my assignment is? You want to know why I'm here? 
I'm here on a rescue mission. Jesus says, I'm here to seek and to save those that are lost. Jesus was sent by God to earth, by God the Father to earth on a rescue mission to both seek out and to save every person that is lost. And I tell you, that is both Jesus' greatest passion. That is both Jesus' greatest mission. It's to seek out and save the lost. And can I tell you this morning, for many of you here today, that's your story as well. That is actually your personal story too. That somewhere along the way, you know that Jesus came on a rescue mission and He found you. Sometimes people say things like, did you find God? It's like, not really. God found me. God, God, was, God was searching and seeking for me my whole life. And then in a moment, I realized that actually God had been seeking me and He awakened me to His love. And, and then in that moment where I, I knew God's love and that moment where I experienced His grace and His forgiveness, I just said yes to Jesus. And then He began this whole journey of transforming and changing my life. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus. Can I tell you at the end of this service, I wanna give you an opportunity, a moment to pray a prayer where you can receive what is the greatest gift that anyone could receive, and that's Jesus into their life. Because that is the gift of salvation. That Jesus says literally, not metaphorically, literally, I can rescue you from your sins. I can rescue you from eternal separation from God. And you and I can now have the sure hope of everlasting life. But I wanna tell you this this morning, that, that's, that's, that's half of the story. The half of the story is actually discovering that God is a seeker and, and God is actually seeking to bring us into relationship with Him. But the second half of that story is once you and I are brought into relationship with Him and Jesus in this story talks about being in the fold. He speaks about this idea of everyone in a relationship with Him, they're in the fold. They're not just having a relationship with God personally, but they're in a community. The picture here is, 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 is really of the church, the 99. They're in, the, they're in a community. They're in relationship with one another and with God. And what we find is that once you and I are called into the fold, it's not God's plan that we would just be content to stay in that fold. You see, I believe that Jesus told us this story, first of all, to show us His heart, but He told us this story also to declare to us our mission. See, in fact, when you and I get saved, Jesus puts in our heart the same passion, the same love that He has for lost people. In Ezekiel 36, 26, He says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and I will give you a tender, responsive heart. What it's saying is that when you and I receive Christ into our life, there is literally a heart transplant that happens. God says, I'll, I'll take out your heart, and in replace of your heart, I will actually give you my heart. He says, I, I will give you a new spirit, referring to the way in which we think. And so what the Bible here is telling us really clearly is actually that being a Christian is an inside out transformation. And so when you and I get a new heart, what happens is that now what matters to God now matters to me. What is His passion becomes my passion. What is His mission becomes my mission. And so life following Christ is more than just about life in the fold. Now it's also about partnering with Jesus to help him find someone else who's lost. You know, in Matthew 28, Jesus also speaks about this idea for you and I to live on mission. It's actually described in Matthew 28 as Jesus' last words that he gives to his followers. The last words that he gives to his followers. And I just pray this morning as we hear these words, I'm praying that what is Jesus' last words becomes our first priority. The, 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 the Jesus' last words before He ascended into heaven that I believe He wanted His followers, His disciples to make them the first priority of their life. He said this, Matthew 28, verse 19. He says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I love it. It says, Therefore, go and make disciples. You know what Jesus is saying? Once you come in, then you go out. Once we get saved, then He wants us to go out and find someone who's lost. You see, for Jesus, being a Christian was more than just about staying in the fold. It was about you and I going out into this world, into the world which we live, on a mission to point as many people as we can to Jesus as well. And I pray that we would never lose sight personally and as a church of the mission that Jesus has given us. 
Do you know in um, April 15, 1912, a ship called the Titanic set off on its maiden voyage. Everyone thought that the Titanic couldn't sink. And I'm sure you know the story. I'm sure you've seen the movie. Leonardo and Kate did it so well through that time. I'm sure you remember the songs even right now. Please don't sing them. <sighs> Please don't sing them. <laughs> but what happened is uh, it did hit an iceberg. What was called the unsinkable ship was actually sinkable. And it ended up beginning to sink. The Titanic had space on it for 48 lifeboats, but there was only 20 lifeboats on the Titanic because they didn't think it was possible that it would probably sink. And so uh, as this ship was going down with 2,300 approximately people on board, they didn't have enough lifeboats to accommodate everyone. And so uh, when they go to put out even the 20 lifeboats they had, some of them they filled up and others they didn't even fill up. And so what ended up was a lot of people ended up in what was freezing cold water. And in literally the minutes and hours that followed, uh, eventually another boat who had seen the distress signal of the Titanic uh, arrived on the scene and it had rescue boats, lifeboats as well, and it lowered down its boats with crew on board. And they began the process of trying to pluck out as many people out of the water as they can into those boats. The end result was that there were groups of people that were in the boats and then there was everyone else who was in this freezing cold water. And that picture is, is pretty interesting because if you're in one of those rescue boats, you're actually in a place of safety. You're, you're now out of harm's way. If you're in a rescue boat, you don't have to fear drowning anymore. But I wanna tell you that every person on that rescue boat also knew that they now had a mission as well. No matter whether they were crew or whether they were rescued passengers themselves, their mission was exactly the same. And that was, we are all called to help pull people out of the water. Church, I just wanna give you this simple reminder this morning. Church, we are called to be a rescue boat. As a church, we are not called to be a cruise ship. We, we are not called to be a yacht where we just sail through life, whichever way the wind blows. Uh, we are actually called to be the crew on the rescue boat. Our mandate, I believe our mission that Jesus gives us is that we are here on this earth to help pull people out of the water. And church, I love that picture that this is the rescue boat. And that you and I, we have a job here as a church and that is to first of all, to get people out of the water so that they're out of harm's way, so that they don't have to fear drowning, so that they no longer risk in their own life, they're in a place of safety. And then they come out of the water, they come into the rescue boat and then they are dried up, they are cleaned up, then they are encouraged and then they are built up and then they, they're established in their, their identity and they're built up in the Word of God, they're placed in community they begin to understand that actually they also have calling and mission on their life to become part of that rescue crew as well on that boat. And I just want to give us this simple reminder this morning that actually, you know what, being a Christian is not just about us being safe. Being a Christian is about us becoming rescuers. It's actually all about you and I reaching out with the love of Jesus to people that are all around us. Why? So that we can help and partner with Christ to pull people out of the water to get them into the boat and see the God who loves them, who gave His life for them, transform them, change them so that they would become everything that God has called them to be. And I believe this with all my heart, that God's heart for His church is that we would be all about lost sons and daughters of His who are in the water. Let me say this. I think sometimes the problem that can happen in Christendom is that there can be a few too many believers who end up becoming boat watchers instead. Rather than joining part of the rescue team, they become boat watchers instead. I think the music's better over in that boat. I'm a bit more of a, a Bethel or upper room kind of worshiper. I, I love the music that's in that boat. I, I think the preaching and teaching over in that boat, it's, it's, I, I love that more expository style of preaching, that, the deeper teaching over there. Or Man, I, I love the small groups that happen over in that boat over there. They, there's more Bible studies and more prayer groups over in there. Look, can I give you a theory? This is not from the Word of God. This is from Andrew's imagination. I just want to clarify this. I think when God hears Christians have those kinds of conversations, I think in heaven, He literally slaps His head in that moment and says, don't they get it? It's not about the boat you're in. 
It's about the people in the water. And it's about every person who's in that boat living their life on mission to help pull as many people out of that water so that they are saved and changed and healed and delivered and set free. Church, it's not about the boat. I love the boat, but it's not about the boat. It's not our mission. The boat is not the mission. Our mission is the people in the water so that they wouldn't drown, so that they wouldn't perish, so that they wouldn't have to live a life without hope and without Christ. And so that they could find the real, the powerful and the life changing and transforming love of Christ for themselves. And so this morning, just we get the musos up this morning, I want to give us just three quick reminders of how you and I this Christmas, I believe this Christmas, that we can reach out to people around us. Are you ready this morning? Simple, just three words, three reminders, three words, three reminders. Here's the first word, love. If we want to reach out to people around us, it starts with love. Jesus says, a new command I give to you, love one another. He says, as I have loved you, just love people like that. With the same love that Jesus loves you, love others like that. You know what I think Jesus is saying? Genuinely love people. As, as Jesus came and as Jesus does in our life, as He loves and serves and cares and, and blesses and encourages and strengthens and does all those things in our life, He says, in the same way, love one another. Matthew 5 verse 14, Jesus spoke with a great picture about what this love can look like in our relationships with one another, in our relationships with people. He says, you are the light of the world. How many of you know we live in a world right now that needs a bit of light? Needs a whole lot of light. Needs a whole lot of Christians who are carrying some light into the darkness, into the fear, into the anxiety, into the turmoil, into the uncertainty of things and whatever's going on. Seems like there's all going on every day. He says, you are the light of the world. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. I love how Jesus makes it really simple when He speaks about love and loving one another. Jesus simply says, I want you to be light. I want your relationships to look like light. Do you know what light does? This, this is a deep scientific teaching right now. Do you know what light does? Light makes everything brighter. So that's what it does. You turn a light on, it makes everything brighter. Jesus says, that's what I want your relationships to look like. That's how I want you to love people. That actually, when you love people, when you serve them, when you encourage them, when you bless them, when you, when you bring them into your home for a meal, when you pray for them, whatever it looks like, you brighten up their world. You brighten up their world because you are carrying a love that comes from God. He says, wherever you go, just make everything brighter. Wherever you go, just make things brighter for people. And let your good deeds, he said, become something that actually makes things brighter. But also, he says, not only will it make things brighter, but it literally will point people towards your heavenly Father. How good is that? In other words, the Bible is saying, as you love, as you do good deeds for people in your life, as you shout them a coffee, as you compliment them, as you send them a text to let them know that you're thinking of them or you're praying for them, uh, as you act in kindness towards another person, whatever that looks like, as you, buy, as you get them a meal, because maybe they're sick, whatever that looks like, He says, not only will that make things brighter for them, but actually in turn, it will help point people to the love of their Heavenly Father. Love, love. Here's a second one. Second reminder how we can reach out to people and that's pray. Pray. Paul speaks about this. He says, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, that's for, that's for people in the world, is for their salvation. You know, one of the most powerful things you and I can do is to pray for someone and keep on praying for them. To pray for someone, whether it be a family member, a friend, someone you work with, one of your neighbours, someone you go to school or uni with, pray for someone and just keep on praying for them. How do you pray? Simple, just ask God to move in their life. Ask that the love of God would begin to draw their heart towards God. Ask that, that they would begin to get what the Bible calls revelation. That just simply means that they would see God for who He really is. And also ask God for opportunity. Ask God to bring opportunity across your path to be able to share your story, to be able to encourage them, be able to help them. You know, that's exactly what happened to the Apostle Paul in the Bible. The Bible says he has this moment. And I have no doubt that there were a lot of people praying that 
the Apostle Paul, who was a, a hater of Christians, a, even a murderer of Christians, would, would somehow find salvation. And God literally, in a moment, on a journey, knocked him off his horse. And the Bible says that a light came from heaven. It opened the eyes of his heart. He saw Jesus for who He really was. And in a moment, He gave His heart. He said yes to Jesus and His life was changed and transformed. Just like the story we heard this morning that Laura shared. It only took one moment in the presence of God for everything to change. Never underestimate the power of your prayers. In a moment, God can change, God can transform any heart. And here's the third thing. The first one is love. The second one is pray. And the third one is to invite. Invite someone to come to church with you. Do you know the power of an invitation from a friend is one of the most significant things. Do you know it's actually for me, my story is it's the power of an invitation from one friend when I was a teenager to come to church and then came to church in a service like this and one moment with God, I knew that God was real. I knew that God was love me and I responded to God and God changed my life. I know the power of one invitation in my life. Do you know there was a, there was a survey done by a group called McCrindle Research a few years ago in Australia. Fascinating survey, a whole bunch of questions they asked the general public about the Christian faith. One of the questions they asked was, have you ever been invited to church before, a church service? You know, 90% of Aussies said, no, I've never been invited to a church service, which is kind of like either most Australians perhaps don't know someone who goes to church or maybe they do know someone, but they haven't been invited yet. But here's what I love, the second question. If you were invited to go to church, what, would you go? Like, what would you say? Do you know 70% of people said yes. If they were invited, they would go to church. Isn't that awesome? Here's my thought. If there's 70% of people that say yes to going to church if they were invited, how many of you know? That means there's a lot of people in our world who'd respond positively if we invited them to church this Christmas. And I'm telling you, I reckon 70% would crank up to 100% if you said that it was your shout for lunch or dinner after that church service as well. I, I tell you, the power of food can amplify that even further as we go. And I'm praying, church, that as we come into Christmas, especially after the year that we had, that as we come into the Christmas shows, as we come into the, the services that we're running, I'm praying that, you know what, every seat in our church and every service and every show would be filled, not just with us, but also with our family, our friends, our workmates, our neighbours, because we chose to love, we chose to pray, we chose to invite.